So I'm going to talk to you today about uh, some unpublished work. This is uh, um, uh, this is a fantastic collaboration with uh, with several um, amazing people. We're working with uh, with Jesse Engert, Kyle Farr, uh, Kevin Wong, Tom Kodermos, and Will. And this this project was really spearheaded by two graduate students, uh, Lakshman, who's in my lab and Will's lab, and Mo, who's in uh, who's in Kevin's lab, uh, and uh, the idea here is uh, we wanted to investigate, um, um, firstly, regulatory dynamics of human cardiogenesis, um, very very early stages of human heart development, and then also see if we can use those models to uh, understand the effects of uh, non-coding mutations in in rare uh, rare diseases like congenital heart disorder. Right. So. Um, so many of you know, I mean, the human heart is the is the first organ that develops um, in the body and uh, that is functional during embryogenesis. Uh, by about day 21, during human embryogenesis, uh, the human heart starts beating. And um, so the correct organogenesis of the heart is really important for um, a lot of subsequent organ development. And um, there's a very interesting orchestration of specific cell lineages in this process, um, and the process has not yet been fully uh, characterized uh, in terms of uh, regulatory and chromatin, uh, transcriptional chromatin changes. Uh, and there are many interesting uh, uh, phenotypes and unfortunate diseases also associated with, with this process of cardiogenesis. Uh, and again, I have to just preface this by saying I am uh, before doing this project, I knew literally nothing about the heart, and I have learned a tremendous amount from from Tom, who's uh, uh, who's in the cardiology department at Stanford, and and Lakshman and Mo as well. So uh, I am basically <laughs> giving you my version of understanding of human cardiogenesis uh, as we go through this talk. All right. Um, so. Um, that that was sort of an introduction to the heart, and and you know the congenital heart diseases uh, they're one of the leading infections, uh, sorry, leading infectious, uh, uh, leading causes of death uh, in in um, in children, particularly uh, before year one. And uh, there are several different uh, phenotypes associated with uh, with these kinds of uh, congenital heart diseases. These are two examples. One is called the tetralogy of the palate. The other is called ventricular septal defects. Uh, so in the, in the ventricular septal defect, basically there's a wall separating the left and right uh, uh, ventricles. And uh, basically that wall development gets affected. Um, in tetralogy of the phallate, basically all four chambers of the heart are structurally affected. And this gives rise to a number of different, um, um, uh, there are also complex phenotypes in, in adults that are associated with developmental disorders. Um, and so studying the heart is, is pretty important, specifically the process of cardiogenesis. Um, <clears throat> so to understand the genetic and molecular basis of these defects, um, there have been several uh, studies conducted in, in, uh, in mice and in avian models. Um, and what's found is that cardiogenesis is primarily driven by two sets of mesodermal linear cell types. Um, and a pluripotent uh, neural crest cells from ectodermal cell lineages, all right? So initially what happens is, uh, again, this is my, my rudimentary understanding of cardiac development. Uh, there's this um, primary heart field and the secondary heart field, okay? These, these two areas right here. And these are two sets of mesodermal cells. And then they eventually form the neural crest. And then the heart starts beating through essentially uh, what's called a heart tube is a single tube. Uh, coming uh, sort of there's an in, inlet and an outlet. And then um, the heart, as you can see, uh, starts looping around and each of the different chambers start forming. And so by, uh, by day 15 of embryonic development, basically that's about when you have all the major uh, cell types um, essentially starting to appear um, in the early heart, all right? So that's a, sort of the time, time course of, of uh, structural development of the heart. Um, so what's interesting is if you look at um, sequence genomes of, of, uh, in, of individuals with uh, congenital heart disease, uh, only about 8% of 
CHD causes can be attributed to mutations in protein coding genes. And so there is again evidence that uh, non-coding elements and gene regulation uh, may play an important role in, in, uh, uh, in affecting early development and, and disorders associated with that. Um, and so there have been a few studies already conducted, uh, mostly focused on transcriptional dynamics. These are two of them, the recent ones. Um, they are at specific time points. <clears throat> and these, uh, there are two or three studies, and they, um, they've helped define sort of the transcriptional landscapes of early cardiogenesis. <clears throat> so what we did in this project um, is we wanted to start, sort of start understanding the, uh, the chromatin dynamics associated with um, early heart development and also model transcriptional regulation, um, mostly to understand basic biology. And then maybe as using this data, we could also use it to understand uh, effects of mutations on gene regulation in these specific cell lineages and cell types at these very early time points. Um, so what Mo did is he, um, he ob obtained uh, fetal heart samples at, uh, at three time points, uh, post-conception weeks, uh, six, eight, and 19. And um, he was able to perform uh, beautiful single cell ataxic experiments uh, in each of these time points. Uh, we were able to get about 30,000 high quality cells, uh, barcodes. And after harmonizing the data and then uh, clustering the cells and projecting onto the UMAP, you get basically something that looks like this. Okay, so you got a pretty good mixing of cells. Um, so these are, these are six week cells, which are very early. Um, these cells are still very much in development. And then uh, by week eight and 19, we basically pick up most of the um, known or expected cell types of the human heart. So this is just uh, the cells marked by, by time point. And instead, if we, if we start marking them by a cell state, by looking at markers and so forth, uh, I'll first walk you through the UMAP in terms of the cell states we learn, and then sort of go back to show you how we uh, picked up those cell states with specific markers, all right? Um, so we pick up uh, most, or maybe uh, in some sense, uh, all the major lineages uh, or cell, cell states and cell types uh, of, of the heart that we expect. Uh, so here's, for example, um, a cluster of cells, which uh, we find have markers associated with myocardium. We got uh, um, atrial cardiomyocytes. We got ventricular cardiomyocytes. This is very interesting. We're able to distinguish even uh, regional versions of these cells, uh, these cell types. We got some early cardiac fibroblasts. Uh, we got cardiac uh, fibroblast progenitors, um, cardiac fibroblasts, endocardial cushion cells, uh, late endocardial cushion cells. Uh, this is um, outflow tract smooth muscle cells, uh, vascular development, um, ventricular smooth muscle cells, pericytes, neural crests, undifferentiated epithelium, sorry, uh, and epicardium. This is the endocardium, a transitioning endocardium cell state, lymph endocardiums, uh, arterial endotheliums, um, capillary endothelium, and venous endothelium. So it's a very rich collection of cell states. And they basically cover three major uh, lineages. There's the myocardium, the epicardium, and endocardium. But we're able to pick up, and of course, neural crest cells, but we're able to pick up a very subtle uh, cell state differences between these. So it's a very rich data set and we're happy that we're able to pick up um, most of the cell states that we expect. Um, so just to give you a view of some of these, uh, what this data looks like, um, once we pseudo bulk these at the level of these clusters, you're able to pick up uh, really nice uh, uh, dynamics of regulatory elements based on chromatin accessibility. Uh, specific in answer. So you're looking at uh, three genes, very well characterized uh, genes in, in cardiac development, TCF21, which is a very important transcription factor, PCAM1 and TN and T2. Uh, we'll come back to some of these later because they have interesting regulatory roles and also uh, interesting predictions of uh, non-coding mutations that might be um, uh, driving some of the um, uh, heart defects in, in, in patients. Um, so just to show you again that, that we see very interesting dynamics of an answer, some of them very specific to these uh, cardiomyocytes, some uh, very specific to fibroblasts, others very specific to endothelial cells, right? Um, so using these, um, 
sort of going back to how we annotated those clusters, what we do is we take uh, these um, cluster specific uh, um, uh, chromatin maps and we project the chromatin activity onto genes. These are referred to as gene scores. And so we can sort of impute um, um, uh, accessibility derived gene activity score for every gene um, in the genome in every cell state and thereby uh, essentially mark the cells by uh, by specific activity of these uh, of these genes uh, derived from accessibility and we can pick up very specific markers of these cell states so for example for myo myocardial cells uh, you can clearly see like um, these cells are very strongly and specifically marked by classic myocardial markers like TNNT2, um, TCTNT2, and, and uh, myosin heavy chain. Uh, similarly, <clears throat> these are endocardial markers, ECAM1, CDH5, Notch1, and these are epicardial markers, DCN, um, MIH11, and col one a Okay, so we use this strategy to basically identify um, marker genes by projecting accessibility onto the genes and then uh, trying to identify marker genes that uh, are well known for specific cell types, cell images. So um, this is of course using just accessibility data, but as I mentioned before, uh, there have been studies looking at a single cell RNA-seq in the same, um, in, in matched or related time points. So we, we took three of these data sets, very recent as you can see, 2019, 2020. We just reprocessed the data sets and we, Harmonize them. Uh, we we clustered the um, the cells from the RNA seq data sets and identified clusters. We see very nice mappings between the uh, cell states we learned from the attack seq data and the single cell um, RNA seq data sets. And we in fact align these using CCA. Um, and this is just the uh, you can see right here. This is the attack seq map uh, colored now by the cell states identified. Uh, from RNA-seq by imputing uh, closest cell types and imputing the RNA uh, in those, in those uh, attack-seq cells. Um, and this is just the correspondence between uh, cell states between uh, RNA and attack-seq. And there's, there's very nice um, correspondence, um, almost one-to-one. -one. Okay, so that's basically the way we take the single cell data and map uh, cell states and cell types uh, using combination of the RNA and attack seq data sets. So, um, given this, uh, given this rich, uh, uh, this rich data and the cell types and cell lineages that we identified, we next decided to uh, try to figure out um, how uh, DNA sequence uh, features might be um, regulating these uh, these specific chromatin landscapes in these specific cell types. Um, so for that, we, um, we moved to uh, use some of our recent um, machine learning models, particularly our deep learning models. Um, and this is just, a, uh, I'm sure some of you have seen previous talks uh, from Avanti and others. Um, this is the BPNet model that we recently published in, 20, um, in February of this year. Uh, basically, BPNet is a um, fully convolutional neural network that uh, starts off with uh, DNA sequence, uh, 2KB um, regions, and maps them to base resolution um, counts of uh, various regulatory assays. So in the original BPNet paper, we had uh, mapped uh, sequences to uh, chip exo and chip seq profiles of transcription factors. Uh, Anna and my group has now, um, and Lakshman, um, they have adapted the BPNet model to, um, to uh, other kinds of assays, particularly DNA seq and attack seq, and it works very well, as I'll show you, also for pseudo bulk attack seq. Um, uh, there are a few interesting changes that need to be made to the models. Uh, firstly, of course, um, the capacity of the models needs to be expanded quite significantly. So, uh, original models like the BBN models that we published for TF binding, I think, had about uh, 50 filters per layer. We expanded these to about uh, about I think 300 or so. Um, and the other important component here is accounting for bias. So um, luckily, at least in the original BPNet paper, uh, the chip exo data we had did not have very significant biases, but um, biases of TN5 and for DNAs, for example, are pretty well known. They have pretty significant effects. 
And so we have a, I don't have too much time to go over that right now. I can, I'm certainly happy to, um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask and I can, I can address them. But the basic idea is we, we learn a bias model. So typically what happens is um, folks have measured TN5 bias on naked DNA. And uh, the classical approach has been to derive a position weight matrix model for the bias and then essentially impute bias on any sequence that you need using that PWM, right? So you can scan the PWM across the sequence or it's a KMA model or a PWM, one of those two. What we do instead is, is we take those same bias tracks, um, you know, the TN5 bias on naked DNA, and we actually fit a neural network to the bias, all right? And what we find is those, uh, the neural network models, um, uh, think of them as fancy KMA models or fancy PWMs, they actually do a better job fitting the bias. And so we can get better imputation of biases on new sequences or, or even um, denoising of the biases on genomic sequences um, using that model. So we have this imputed bias, right? Which is learned from an actual bias track. And then that bias track actually feeds into the BPNet model. So the BPNet model is trying to fit the uh, pseudo bulk single cell attack seek profiles. Again, base resolution counts five prime ends um, using a combination of sequence and the bias, okay? And uh, we have a few other changes here where we, we fit the bias first, okay? So we fit a model that just fits the bias to the observed ataxic data, and then we fit the sequence as a secondary component so that it essentially learns implicitly residual that the bias cannot learn. And the reason we do this is just, just to, again, give you uh, some uh, intuition why is if you try to co-train the model with sequence and bias simultaneously, we've occasionally seen that the model ignores the bias track and just learns it from the sequence. Okay, so you just have to be a little bit careful when you couple multiple modalities into a neural network. Um, you would hope that the network will equally learn, you know, will, will learn the components or the contributions of each modality, sequence and bias automatically, but um, due to the training process, sometimes there is instability. And if you want to be really careful about it, it's better to first fit, uh, for example, the bias uh, to the ataxic data, uh, or sorry, fit the ataxic data to the bias, and then uh, plug in the sequence component and essentially have the sequence implicitly predict the residual. All right, so those are a few little tweaks to the original BPNet model, but nothing, nothing else substantial. Um, so we get, we get, again, very, we were surprised that we get really um, very high quality predictions. Uh, this is one cherry picked example, um, observed and predicted profiles. Um, it's very nice concordance at single base resolution um, uh, between the observed and predicted profiles. And just to, again, be clear here, we fit a separate model to every cell type, okay? So we have pseudo bulk ataxic profiles for each of these cell states or cell types. And then we fit separate BPNet models to each of them. So just to give you a sense for the performance of the models, um, this is, um, oh, and I forgot to mention one more thing. So um, in case you haven't uh, read the BPNet paper or not aware of how it works, we predict two entities when we're trying to uh, estimate a base resolution count profile. The first entity is the total counts of reads within um, each thousand base pair window. So that's just the total number of counts of, of a taxi. And then we also predict uh, base resolution probabilities of observing reads at each position. So if you just take the total number of reads that you predicted and you multiply them by the probabilities in each position, you basically predict the, uh, the counts of reads at each position, all right? So we evaluate performance of the model on total counts. That's what I'm showing you here. <clears throat> so it's pretty nice high correlation. Uh, and we also evaluate uh, the performance of the model on the shapes of the profiles. That is, if you take the observed uh, profile as a property distribution and you compare it to the predicted profile as a property distribution, what would be the Jensen-Shannon distance, okay? And um, this, this axis, unfortunately, I should have relabeled it, but um, it's actually a little misleading. It is a min-max normalized Jensen-Shannon distance, okay? So Jensen-Shannon distance basically is measuring the dis the difference in the probability distributions between observed and predicted, the lower the better, but we flipped this on its head. So what we do is we compute the Jensen-Shannon distance between uh, pseudo replicates of the observed data 
that gives us sort of a, a upper bound on how good the radar could be, right? How good the similarity could be between replicates or pseudo replicates. That's sort of our upper bound on how good the JSD could be. We also compare the JSD between the observed profiles and the and randomized profiles. That gives us a lower bound. And then we compute a min-max normalized JSD um, um, where we uh, compare basically the observed to predicted against the upper bound and the lower bound for each bin in the genome. And then we, uh, um, we min-max normalize it. So now basically what you're seeing here is sort of an inverted jensen shannon distance uh, with a scale that is more interpretable. If you see one, it means the observed and predicted profile similarity is as high as the similarity between pseudo replicates. And if you see uh, something like zero, uh, that would mean that the, uh, the JSD between the observed and predicted profiles is basically the same as observed versus random. So it's very terrible, right? So the higher, the better. So for each of these cell types, you can see that uh, Jensen channel distances are pretty close to, you know, they're very high they're in the 0.9s to 0.7s. These two cell types are, um, um, have very few cells. They're less than 2,000 cells. And you can still get pretty good performance, uh, about 0.7 GSD, uh, uh, min-max GSD. All right, so um, we're pretty happy with uh, this, of course, cross-validation performance. So we're holding out entire chromosomes, and we're predicting uh, these profiles in peaks of those chromosomes, and we are, um, we are um, computing the GSD in cross-validation, all right? And um, it's five folds, and what you're seeing the error bars here are five folds. So the models are pretty stable across folds as well. They're not super unstable. So hopefully that convinces you that the models are uh, doing a pretty good job mapping sequence to accessibility. Um, so what can we do with these models? So we first take these models, and um, for any observed profile, any predicted profile, any any genomic element uh, in a specific cell type, we use a model to infer base resolution contribution scores using a deep lift algorithm. Um, and so let me just show you um, a few case studies of what this looks like. Uh, so I'll start off with this, uh, with this gene called TNNT2, uh, very interesting gene, uh, major cardiac gene implicated in cardiomyopathy and heart failure, and many other heart disorders. Uh, it's primarily active in three cell types. Uh, it's active in the earlier, early cardiomyocytes, the atrial cardiomyocytes, and the ventricular cardiomyocytes. Okay, it's a very cardiomyocyte-centric gene, you can see it right here. And uh, the chromatin accessibility profiles look pretty similar across these, uh, these three cell types for this particular, like this is close to the promoter of TNNT2. Um, so we can now use our models for each of these cell types to dissect uh, sequence drivers of the promoter, right? And so I'm just gonna walk you through um, you know, two, two cell types. Um, th actually three cell types, but let's start off with the atrial cardiomyocytes. And when you interpret the sequence um, underlying that, that peak, um, you, you find basically the model tells us that um, you see a T motif, SRF motif, and a GABA motif uh, jointly regulating that, that particular promoter. And you can see expression of TNNT2 in that cell type. Now, interestingly, if you switch um, that same region in ventricular cardiomyocytes, you see minor changes in the, in the accessibility profiles. But if you look at the inferences from the model, you actually see different combinations of, of motifs driving the same promoter. So again, the gene is expressed. You see TED is common to both atrial and ventricular cardiomyocytes, but MEF2C is specifically uh, predicted to be active in um, in the VC, uh, VCMs and SRF specific to uh, ACMs, uh, PRX1, again, specific to uh, VCMs, and then GATA is shared between the two. And just as a control, if we, if we look at um, the same region in atrial endothelial cells where the gene is basically not expressed and there's, there's no ataxic peak there, the model correctly predicts um, no motifs active. And just to be clear, uh, this is all on uh, uh, models where these regions are in the test folds. Okay, so we're not, we don't have some overfitting bias or something like that. We are we are using models trained on other chromosomes to predict. Uh, I, as I mentioned, we have models on five folds, and so for any enhancer, and we throw throughout the talk, anytime I show you any predictions, 
Uh, we're always showing you predictions where that enhancer is in the test fold. So we are not sort of showing some kind of training bias. Uh, so this is, of course, a prediction. In fact, I just want to mention, I'm going to uh, immense amount of hand waving today uh, because uh, we, we have a lot of predictions and our experimental validation is ongoing. So unfortunately, I'm not going to be showing you any fantastic uh, validation results. So just take everything I show you with a grain of salt. Many of these could not be real. Hopefully, they will turn out to be real. Uh, uh, all we've been able to do is show strong statistical evidence for um, for these results. Uh, we show, I mean, these results hold exact across five fours and across different random seeds and so forth. So we try to try to at least verify that these are not artifacts of some specific four, or some specific random seed, some specific model. Okay, so most of the results I'm showing you today are at least robust statistically. All right, so forgive me for not having experimental data yet. Um, so this is just an example of even like a promoter that uh, that is, you know, that is um, uh, constituted uh, constitutively active in a collection of closely related cell types. We we are seeing kind of differential regulation uh, through uh, through potentially different transcription factors kicking in. And uh, I don't I don't have time to show you this, but this sort of association differential association between different TFs, these diff these specific TFs holds genome wide as well. So. We generally see that the combination of like um, you know MEF and TED um, is 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 much more enriched in ventricular cardiomyocytes than uh, MEF and TED um, in 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 atrial cardiomyocytes. So we we see some genome wide evidence of this sort of uh, specific uh, cooperative combinations too. Okay. Um, so if we just perform this across all the all the regulatory elements in all the cell types, so you're on the each each axis, uh, so each column, each row is a different cell type. Uh, each of the columns are um, a variety of transcription factor motifs. We can use the models to identify active motifs, right? So not just the presence of the motif in the sequence, but the, the obviously the motif has to be present in the sequence, and the model should say it's in fact predictive or active. And so if we couple those and we run them through ChromeVar, which gives us enrichments in each of these, these, uh, these cell types, we get really beautiful cell type specific enrichments for, um, for specific uh, motifs of specific transcription factors. And a lot of this um, makes sense uh, based on previously known biology. Um, so one question you might ask is, well, you could have just done this with any other motif discovery method, right? Why do you need deep lift and all this stuff? Uh, so we just looked at the relative enrichments of uh, the same analysis, this, this sort of enrichment analysis that I showed you uh, before and after using BPNet. Okay, so one idea is you could just take, you could do motif discovery using more meme or Homer or whatever on your uh, ataxic peaks and then look for enrichments of these motifs. Uh, or you can take the motifs and you can look for active motifs through BPNet and then look at the enrichments. And across the board for uh, pretty much all transcription factors, we see pretty substantial uh, in, improvements in cell type specific enrichment of TFs, uh, of TF motifs uh, after you use BPNet versus, versus not. And also, again, to show you, um, if, we, if we try to support this using uh, attack seek footprints, bias corrected footprints, um, what you see is if you use the uh, predictive motif instances from BPNet. Um, and you compare them to all motif instances in peaks. Okay, so these are not obviously. If you looked at motif instances outside peaks, they would have no attack seek signal. So that's not a good control. Uh, these are all motif instances within uh, within peaks, using uh, FIMO thresholds, which which is a common approach. And these are BPNet predictive motifs, and you can just see that the there's a dramatic difference in the um, in the footprint score, the, the the flanks and the and the and the summits. Okay. Um, so uh, this sort of just shows us that we are able to pick up uh, very interesting uh, locus specific uh, predictions of which transcription factor motifs are active, combinations that are cell type specific, and we get much nicer enrichments. So next, what we do is uh, we move on to um, what I showed you is sort of an analysis of very discrete cell states, right? And cardiogenesis is obviously not a discrete I uh, mean, it, it's a continuous sort of uh, event of cell states appearing from other cell states. And so um, we also try to infer trajectories uh, using optimal transport. So Lakshman 
what he did is he adapted uh, the uh, optimal transport approach which was originally developed for single cell RNA-seq uh, to a taxic data. And basically what this approach does is we start with populations of cells that are observed at week 19 of development. And then um, using automatic transport, you try to find populations of cells that would require the least number of changes to the chromatin landscape as quantified by like earth mover distance uh, in chromatin accessibility space. And using this, we try to identify the ancestors okay, of, of each, each cell state. By iterating this process, you can basically um, sort of move backward in time and try to infer, uh, you know, uh, zero time temporal trajectories um, through the cell states. Uh, so this is what it looks like. This is the transition table between the different cell states. And we basically pick up uh, eight uh, high confidence trajectories. Okay, so we again repeat this using multiple runs and perturbations of the data, and we end up with uh, with eight major differentiation trajectories. Um, and many of them make a ton of sense. I don't have, again, time to run through each of those just so I can get to um, the second half uh, or the last part of the talk, all right? Um, I'm gonna run you through a few, just at least one example of, of what we can, how we can couple the BPNet models with this sort of trajectory analysis to understand, um, you know, which transcription factors might be driving um, specific, um, uh, zero time trajectories. So here we're looking at is uh, a trajectory from uh, outflow tract cells to smooth muscle cells, right? From the C4 cell state to C11. And if you actually just um, color these cells by uh, time point, right? Of the data collection, like the fetal heart uh, developmental time point, you can see these are um, very early, right? Six weeks, and these are uh, late 19 weeks. So you're actually seeing a true temporal trajectory as well that matches up with the zero temporal trajectory as inferred using automatic transport. Um, so what we can do is uh, we can take this SMC uh, trajectory and it, it, as I said, it begins in the uh, begins with these OFT cells, uh, outflow tract cells, and um, we can understand sort of identify the peaks that are driving these uh, these specific this specific trajectory. We can identify a specific dynamic. Uh, um, of these peaks across zero time. And if you take collections of peaks that, that you know, appear early versus mid versus late, you get very interesting specific uh, gene ontology enrichments corresponding to uh, early um, processes, uh, blood vessel development and muscle contractile, smooth muscle function. So you're really seeing uh, uh, the regulatory elements that are driving this trajectory also match up very nicely with the cell identity. Uh, of the early states and the late states. And of course, then we can also take uh, BPNet models, predictions or motifs, uh, as well as the expression levels of potential transcription factors that bind those motifs and identify TFs that have similar motif dynamics that match the dynamics of the peaks. <clears throat> and um, these same TFs motifs, we can map them to their potential binding factors uh, by looking at expression trajectories of these uh, transcription factors that, that are correlated with the motif dynamics, okay? So we can get a pretty nice, um, for every trajectory actually, we have such a um, prediction of variable peaks, associated motifs that are potentially regulating uh, in cis uh, and uh, potential uh, trans regulators that might be binding those motifs uh, by looking at the expression of the TFs which have matched motifs, okay? Um, so I'm going to walk you through other interesting um, uh, locus-specific analysis we can do. So uh, I'm going to show you this uh, gene called PDGRF-B. Uh, it's a critical gene that's required for proper differentiation of vascular smooth muscle cells. And if you look at the chromatin activity around, around the gene, the genes right here, here's the TSS, you can see that the TSS is, is kind of active and is, um, is, is, is reasonably active even early or accessible early. It, it, it bumps up and then goes down, but you see the enhancers popping up much later, right? So let's, let's just compare the dynamics of the promoter with um, dynamics of the distal landscape, uh, potential enhancers contributing to uh, <clears throat> regulation of the gene and the expression, okay? So this is sort of the trajectory of the promoter. You start from uh, the earliest time point to the last time point, um, 
scale is not super intuitive. Uh, sorry, this should have been starting off at zero. This is this is not like zero. It's 0 0.6. So you can see it's reasonably active. The promoter it goes down a little bit and then really peaks at about uh, uh, eight weeks, and then starts coming down again. Okay, so it's it's active throughout, but with with a variable dynamic trajectory. <clears throat> now, if you take the the uh, the collaborative score of all the enhancers around that gene across time, uh, across zero time, you see a sort of different picture. The enhancers again rise and they continue rising, right? So you, you can sort of see it here as well. Like this enhancer pops up first and then this one, these two pop up very strongly later, this one pops up later as well. Um, and if you compare that to the expression of, of that gene, you can clearly see that the gene actually fires much later. So you can see that the promoter is is kind of constitutively active. And then later on, a bunch of enhancers kick in and really drive the expression forward, okay? And uh, you might be interested in, uh, okay, so this is an interesting dynamic. What are the transcription factors that are temporally regulating these enhancers and promoters? So let me walk you through that. These are predictions of the model. So we can take the VPNet model at, at week six and look at this enhancer that pops up early and the model predicts um, HOXA2 as binding that, uh, as regulating that, that enhancer. This enhancer, that, this promoter that, that pops up um, much more strongly uh, later, uh, there's one motif that is specific to this promoter. There are several motifs, but I'm just showing you specific ones that are uh, very specific to each of those time points. XBP1 pops up very specifically uh, at eight, uh, eight weeks. And then if you look at this enhancer, which is much later, you see basically MEF2C popping up um, very specifically in that enhancer. And if you just compare this to the expression of those transcription factors, you again see something very nice um, correlating with the motif dynamics. So HOXA2, which is predicted to be specific to uh, six weeks, you can see has high expression and the expression drops over time. XB1, which is specific to eight weeks, you can again see sort of the similar trajectory where it's kind of uh, weaker early and then gets much stronger in terms of expression, then drops again. Um, and MEF2C has the exact opposite. It's much, it's a late factor. So it, it's expressed later and the motif pops up later as well. So it's very nice because even though VP9 hasn't been trained on any expression data, the motif dynamics it's seeing even at individual elements uh, are supported by uh, corresponding expression dynamics of those same transcription factors. So just to summarize this again, like you've got this um, specific TFs coming in at specific times at specific enhancers, and then nicely supported by expression of those um, of those transcription factors as well. So we have many such interesting stories. Uh, pretty much any locus, any gene, you can take it apart in terms of um, you know, pseudo time trajectory of expression of promoter activity, iterative enhancers. And of course, I'm not mentioned, we've, we've run enhancer gene linking uh, inference as well, using the accessibility and expression, just looking at correlations gives us potential links between enhancers and promoters. And that's how we, we infer some of these, uh, these collective uh, enhancer um, and gene score dynamics, okay. So in the last last part of the talk, I'll just focus on <clears throat> how we've started to use these models also to try, try to understand um, non-coding de novo mutations in congenital heart disease. You expect that the cardiogenesis process um, and particularly chromatin maps may be uh, well suited to allow us to dissect. Uh, firstly, uh, when you sequence these individuals, you often pick up uh, a large number of de novo mutations. It's hard to pin down precisely the ones that are causal. Uh, in some cases, you're able to map them to uh, protein coding uh, genes, uh, mutations that disrupt protein coding genes. But as I mentioned, um, a large number of cases that we, we find um, uh, from several sequencing projects um, uh, don't end up showing any, any hits in uh, protein coding genes. And so the hypothesis is that they must be non-coding. And so that's sort of, that's the scenario we're gonna look at, right? So um, what we did is we took, took um, uh, whole genome sequencing data from uh, two consortia. There's PCGC, uh, which has sequenced a large number of uh, families. Um, and uh, these individuals, uh, these children basically are afflicted with uh, uh, various versions of congenital heart disease. Uh, we, we picked individuals that did not have any um, predicted coding mutations uh, or 
at least known coding mutations that could that could uh, explain the phenotype. And as a control, we just took um, the Simon Simplex uh, consortium data. Um, these are 1,902 families that don't have at least don't have congenital heart disease. All right. And uh, we take all of these mutations from all the cases and all the controls, and we push them uh, through the model. So we have the two alleles, right, of each of each mutation. Uh, we we use uh, use BPNet model from each cell type. We we induce a mutation. This, of course, people have done before in many different contexts. We're just doing it specifically here for the CHD mutations. Uh, we push them through the model, and the model, like if I mean in this cartoon at least. Um, when you switch to C to an A, if you see a significant disruption of the of the signal, and you see a significant disruption in the in the in the deep lift scores, um, those are sort of the predictions that we would we would bet on. Okay, so we can rank all these predictions based on uh, sorry all these mutations based on cases and controls based on predicted effect sizes uh, from the models in each of the cell types. So you get a cell type specific prediction for the effect sizes. All right. Um, so I'm going to start with a case study and then sort of show you more global analyses. So this was one of our strong hits. Um, JARIT2 is a major cardiac disease gene. It's, uh, it's in, it has, in fact, been found to have coding mutations in several individuals um, in tetralogy of the phallic, uh, which is one of these rare diseases. Um, there's a point mutation that we find that scores very strongly. It happens to fall in this enhancer um, right here. Apologies for the tiny uh, shot, trying to fit too many cell types within one uh, slide. But you can see that this enhancer pops up um, right here. It's quite specific to um, these endothelial cells, particularly artery endothelial cells. And um, what we can do is take, the, take that mutation and score it through each of the models for each of the cell types. And what we pick up is um, specifically in artery endothelial cells, we see that this G2C mutation actually disrupts a SOX13 binding site. And this enhancer is predicted to regulate um, the JARET2 gene based on enhancer promoter linking through the correlation of accessibility with expression. Um, what's also interesting is if you look at the JARET2 promoter, it is constitutively active, right? So, but if you look at the expression of JARET2, it is very specific to these endothelial cells, all right? So it appears that this, these, this enhancer might be popping up specifically in endothelial cells, driving expression of, of JARIC2. And here the model predicts that um, a G2C mutation disrupts a SOX13 motif in this enhancer that regulates JARIC2. Here's another example. This is um, TFAP2, which is an also very important um, cardiac gene. Again, previously known to have coding mutations. In one of the individuals, we find uh, G2C mutations disrupting an SP1 binding site, having a pretty strong effect on the profiles. But in this case, uh, the enhancer is predicted, sorry, the uh, mutation is predicted to have a very specific effect in, in um, neural crest cells. All right? So it's a different cell type that that's, appears to be driving the signal. So these are individual cases, but um, how do we know if any of this is actually you know, real or are these just false positives? Um, so we use the case control data to do basically enrichment, enrichment analyses, okay? So I'm gonna walk you through a bunch of enrichments uh, from terrible to good, okay? So let's just start off with relative ratios of, of mutations, non-coding mutations in PCGC versus the controls. So we start with 54,126 um, uh, mutations in peaks versus 110,055 mutations uh, in peaks uh, for controls, okay? So these are not all the mutations. These are mutations that are non-coding and in, uh, in the peaks of any, any of the cell types. Okay, that's, that's the starting number. So um, there, there isn't any, obviously any enrichment. You have mutations in peaks. In cases, you have mutations in peaks and controls. Uh, if you all have these with, um, uh, with, the, uh, with just, just by, so let, let's just think we, we, we're going to try to map, uh, try to prioritize them based on overlap with peaks of a specific cluster, right? So these are just all peaks uh, from all, all cell types. If you just took peaks from the arteries, right, from the single cell ataxic uh, cluster, and you decided to take mutations in the cases that overlap peaks and arteries, mutations in controls that overlap peaks and arteries, again, there is no enrichment, okay? Um, 
what if you take peaks from um, pseudo bulk, like the fetal heart, all, all like you just pseudo bulk all the peaks and you look look at what happens, uh, you get you again get no enrichments. Um, I might be actually wrong with this number. I think this is all the sorry. This might be all the mutations that are non-coding in the cases in control. So this is uh, if you overlap the mutations with all the peaks. Uh, this is uh, if you overlap them specifically with arteries. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's again, there's no enrichment between cases and controls. Now, what happens if you train a BBNet model on um, on the pseudo bulk total fetal heart data? So there's no cell type specificity. You just take all the reads and you treat them as if it was a bulk sample, and you train a BBNet model on the bulk data, and you make these predictions, uh, and you you predict mutations in peaks that have strong effects in cases versus controls. Uh, you get a 70 to 67 ratio, which is again there's no enrichment. But as soon as you now train, look at cell type specific BPNet models, right? Uh, this is the BPNet model in arteries and you prioritize mutations with strong effects in cases versus controls, uh, exact same effect sizes, okay? Um, uh, as a threshold for prioritizing. Um, you get really nice strong enrichments. It's almost uh, more than a twofold uh, or close to a twofold enrichment, okay? So what this is telling us is it's not sufficient to have just cell type specific peaks. That would be this, right? If you just use the peaks to prioritize the mutations, uh, we really can't distinguish. We get a lot of false positives. Uh, but if you use the cell type specific peaks with the BBNet models, where we predict the effects of the mutations uh, through the models lens, then we start seeing discrimination between the cases and the controls, okay? And we can do this for all the cell types. And what's very interesting is, so these are each of the different cell types and the colors are representing the enrichments. And we see, again, the maximal enrichment is coming from the endothelial population, okay? So it's coming from uh, three SMCs, lymphatic ECs, scapulary, arterial, um, endothelial cells. Um, and it's, it's potentially hinting to the fact that CHD is a structural defect of the heart, okay? Like it's sort of supporting that idea. So it's not that every cell type is enriched for uh, these CHD mutations, there are specific cell types that are much more enriched, but there are it's it's quite distributed across um, across different cell types. We can take all of these hits and see what TFs they mutate, and we see some interesting recurrence. So these are recurrent transcription factor binding sites that are mutated in different individuals uh, based on the uh, predictions of the model. So we see you know KLF SP uh, SP ones SPI SOX ETS MEF twos FOX Many of these very well-known um, important regulators uh, of cardiogenesis. And finally, we can also take our mutations, non-coding mutations, and uh, see if, uh, if we see enrichments uh, for proximity of those mutations to genes that have previously, previously been identified to have uh, coding mutations in other CHD patients. And, and so we see actually pretty nice enrichments this is if you just take all the prioritized mutations in arteries and you look for uh, enrichments for um, being near genes uh, uh, that have been previously identified as having coding mutations in cases versus controls. Um, if you do this um, specifically um, uh, near CHD genes, um, you get even high enrichments. And if you if you make these cell type specific, like just the arterial cells, uh, you get even even higher enrichments. Okay. So there's nice support that um, the non-coding mutations we are finding tend to happen to be near uh, genes that also have been identified to have coding mutations in other individuals. Uh, and it's, the enrichments are much stronger in the cases than in the controls, okay? So um, hopefully that gives you, that's where we are at right now with the project. Uh, we are actually performing CRISPR experiments and MPRA experiments on these um, and many of these these 45 prioritized mutations to see if we can see at least regulatory effects in the specific cell types. Um, and so, just to summarize, um, <clears throat> I showed you like a comprehensive map of cell states in early uh, cardiogenesis, um, uh, jointly inferred using uh, new single cell ataxic data. Uh, as well as integrating single cell RNA data from previous uh, studies. Uh, we identified eight major traje trajectories in human cardiogenesis. Using BPNet models, we were able to dissect a TF motif syntax, its dynamics across the regulatory elements, their target genes, 
and also dissecting regulation of, uh, of smooth trajectories across cell states. Uh, and then uh, interestingly, if you take these models, I mean, these data sets and cell types, and you use the uh, models to derive uh, uh, mutation effect scores, um, we're actually able to see um, cell type specific enrichments in cases versus controls. Once you use a combination of the cell type specificity of the peaks, as well as the disruption effects from a predictive model of mutations. And we can, we can make predictions about the TF motifs that are disrupted, their target genes, and potential target cell types of action. Uh, so I'll just, again, thank uh, myself, obviously. <laughs> um, I should have changed the slide. But um, uh, again, Lakshman and um, Mo really are the, are the drivers of this whole approach, of this whole study. Um, really want to thank Tom for like, this would have been impossible without his help, uh, considering that we knew and still know zero like knowledge about <laughs> cardiogenesis or our or hearts. Uh, this has been a fantastic collaboration. We learned a lot in the process and hopefully the validations work out and we can submit the paper soon. Hope, hopefully we have time for a few questions. <laughs>